and welcome to another episode of Seeds of Music, the web's number one resource for independent artists. I'm your host Kyle Williams and this is our weekly web show where I bring on music industry professionals and successful independent artists to talk about the ways to build a bigger, stronger fan base and sell more music online and at shows. Now real quick, we have an iTunes podcast. Just click or head over to iTunes and type in Seeds of Music, Rise Above the Noise, and when that comes up, hit subscribe and you'll download all of the episodes automatically to your device. And before you go, if you really, really want to help out the show, leave a rating and a review. This will improve our ranking in iTunes, plus give the show more exposure, help more artists, and will help me to get bigger and better interviews onto Seeds Music. I'll also give you a shout out in the next episode where I'll read out your review and read out your name just to say thanks. Now, on today's show, we have Rick Barker of MusicIndustryBlueprint.com. Okay, and Rick was a former manager for Taylor Swift. And what we're going to talk about is why you don't need a major label to have a music career. And I know that you know the message here at Seeds of Music and what I believe in is the same thing. You don't need a major label to have any sort of successful music career. I've seen it time and time again with many of the independent artists that have come on the show and that I've also worked with. So let's jump right in. All right, Rick. So first off, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on to the Seeds of Music web show. This is really, really monumental, you know, having uh, you know, someone who's worked with Taylor Swift on the show. Well, sometimes that can be overrated, so I hope not to disappoint. <laughs> no, but, you know, I'll tell you what's not overrated is just the extensive knowledge you have uh, on uh, particular tactics that will help independent artists get their music out there and build the relationships that's going to actually get them a successful career. So I'm super excited to jump into it. I've got all my uh, questions lined up here, so cool. let's, let's just jump right at it. You know, um, first thing I want to reference is you wrote this really, really awesome article uh, uh, called Quit Bitching About Radio and Major Labels. And the reason I love that is because um, I find that a lot of what holds back uh, independent artists, you know, the ones that I've uh, worked with personally, or, you know, even some people that listen to this show, it's there, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's just to be honest, there's a lot of, of, of complaining going on about things outside of the artist's control, you know, like I don't have a successful career because, uh, you know, sure. the radio right person hasn't come along and heard me playing at my at my gig. And so the cool thing it, inside your article that you address is, is, you know, this idea that the bottom line is like you don't need a label to have a career in music, but if you want to dominate the world, yes, you'll need to leverage the right. relationships with those labels because they have they have access to that. Um, so I wanted to just I just wanted to jump in just on the the aspect for right now of independent artists who don't have a label uh, who might not be at that point yet. Uh, why exactly do they not need a major label deal to have a career in music? Well, the thing is, is that you know basically label publishing company. They're banks, you know, and the banks want to be paid back in a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And independent artists right now, if I wish I had talent, this is the time I would like <laughs> to be an independent artist because the stores open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, mm -hmm. and no one controls the message but me. That hasn't always been the case. Most independent artists that I see think they're better than they are, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, they feel that, wow, if I was just seen by this person. Well, here's the thing. If you're selling hard tickets and you're dominating sales on iTunes, which you don't need a major label to be able to get your music sound scanned on iTunes, they will find you. The problem is, is most haven't taken it serious and treated it like a business yet. Most haven't given themselves the opportunity to put themselves in a yeah. position to turn the label deal down. Yeah. Because right now, the same opportunities for major label artists are available for independent artists. Look at Macklemore. You know, look yeah. at some of these bands that have gone out and had incredible success. Key number one is identifying in your own mind what is success to me. Mm -hmm. If success to you is creating your art, getting your art in front of people, and being able to pay your bills, yeah. then you have an opportunity to be successful without a major label. If your goal is to have world domination and be yeah. you too, 
you better start finding out what it is that a major label is looking for in order to help you get there yeah. because you can't get there without a major label in that capacity because you don't have the resources or the years of experience yeah. or the marketing expertise and a lot of things that go along yeah. with that. Not to say you can't be successful, but yeah. you got to measure what success is to you and create the plan accordingly. That's awesome, man, because, you know, it, it, one thing that I think – that I can apply not only to, uh, you know, what I've experienced, not only as an entrepreneur and a musician, but it's like the first thing that's really important is just having clarity on what you sure. want, you know. So if you're a musician, you need to be really clear on, you know, what you want your music career to look like. Like you, you should be able to close your eyes and visualize what that kind of life would look like for you. I agree with that. I also agree that you need to figure out right away who you're doing this for. Because there's a lot of independent artists that are all about the art and they're broke because yeah. they never went and determined whether there was an audience that was also hungry for their art. Yeah. Uh, so with any successful business, you know, no matter what it is, you need to make sure that there's a consumer for your product. If your consumer just happens to be related to you or is only related to you, then don't be disappointed. Don't start talking smack about the system and the man and the labels because you keep writing stuff that only you or your family like. So yeah. a lot of times what happens is an artist just needs to sit down, do some soul searching and say, okay, as music comes first in the word music business, business has more letters. And business doesn't mean understanding every single aspect of the business. It yeah. means understanding that in order to be in business, you have to sell a product that product be in you or a t-shirt or a concert ticket yeah. or your music. So if you don't have consumers to purchase those products, you need to go back in and take a look at your business. Yeah. And what do you find uh, make uh, artists get hung up on this, you know, hung up on that? I only you know want to speak department. for them. I just know that there's a lot of artists that I, that I know that think they're better than they are. There's a lot of parents that think their kids are better than they are. There's a lot of people that walk on American Idol, The Voice, and X Factor thinking they're better than they are. Most of the time, it's because they only surround themselves with people that kiss their ass. Yeah. They only surround themselves yeah. with people that say how great they are. Yeah. That's dangerous. That's yeah. more dangerous, in my opinion, than having someone that you can trust. Yeah. You know, Because what happens is, is a lot of those reactions that we see – on those television shows of people bawling and crying, yeah, that's real emotion and tears because up until that point, no one's ever told them the truth. Yeah, and that's the part that's dangerous. Yeah. Is sometimes we don't want to hurt the artist's feelings because let's face it, everything I love about artists is everything I hate about artists. <laughs> but I need them to be artists because they're the ones that are going to get up on stage and put themselves out. Yeah. So there's these little quirky things that we're constantly we're trying to massage the egos, but we're also trying to point people in the right direction. That's how I ended up as Taylor's manager yeah. with no experience. Everyone else was telling her how great she was. I kept telling her the work that had to be done and put the plan together so that she would go out and do the work. Yeah. She didn't need another yes person yeah. at her camp. So how did, that, how did you come about that uh, gig? Well, what happened was is my background's in radio. I did radio for over 15 years. I can hear and the I radio always, voice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And the face for radio, yeah, too. There you go. <laughs> uh, I basically have always promoted live music in Santa Barbara, where I did my whole radio career. I launched a, a dual CD project, uh, gosh, almost 20 years ago, called Santa Barbara's Unsigned Heroes, Volume 1 and 2. And at that time, we had Dishwalla, Toad the Wet Sprocket, Ugly okay. Kid Joe. We had a lot of great bands coming out of that area in the early 90s. And we had a local music show on our radio station, so I got a chance to get to know a lot of the local bands. 2001, I ended up launching and building a country radio station, fell in love with the music. I, I said, man, I grew up in Alabama. I guess I'm qualified as anybody oh, to run we this did. thing. Where in Alabama did you grow up? Muscle Shoals. I uh, grew up uh, outside of Huntsville in Madison Okay, County. no, we were, we were real close to each other there. So <laughs> what I ended up doing was I've always been a person. I have no formal music business education. Matter of fact, I've got a couple credits from a, you know, Santa Barbara Community College. Yeah. But I did a GED. School just wasn't for me. I wanted hands-on learning experience. Yeah. Some people, school's for them. That just, I wasn't wired that way. Yeah. So I've always asked questions. I've always 
tried to find solutions to problems. So uh, when, when I started doing this country radio station, I saw how accessible the artists were. I ended up creating uh, an acoustic radio tour called Nashville to You. Uh, if you couldn't get to Nashville, we'd bring Nashville to you. It gave uh, young artists a chance to get in front of an audience early on and get paid while they were on radio tour, which freaked the labels out. So like, oh, my God, we're getting paid. And they enjoyed that and appreciated that. Yeah. So that's how I got on the radar of the labels. I helped launch Sugarland, Little Big Town, Rodney Atkins. You know, those names mean something if you're within country. If you're not, they're like, huh? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we just know that, you know, Sugarland and Little Big Town were nominated for Grammy. So maybe someone saw them on the Grammys at yeah. one point. Yeah. But I was approached by Scott Borchetta when he started Big Machine Records to be a West Coast regional record promoter. And when I found out what it paid, I'm like, dude, I'm all in. I'll promote. It was doubling my radio salary. So I had nine, nine states, 60 radio stations that I was responsible for trying to get the music played. And I asked him at that time, I said, Scott, why are you choosing me? You could pick anybody you want to work for you. And he said, well, I say this is a compliment, but you're too dumb to know any better. And I went, Really? That's a compliment. He goes, Rick, he says, I'm starting this label with Jack Ingram, who's a regional act out of Texas. Danielle Pettit had, had a failed single already at radio on another label, and this 15-year-old that no one had ever heard of named Taylor Swift. He said, everyone will tell me why it won't work. He says, you just seem to go in one direction. So I accepted the job. About seven, eight months later, I get a call saying, hey, you know, Taylor, we're getting ready to set her up to go out on radio tour. She's been spending all this time writing. She hasn't really performed a lot. Would you take her out on the Nashville to you tour? Because I still had those relationships and teach her radio. And her and I got together and she wanted to learn. I wanted to teach. She was willing, you know, to do things that I told her, if you want to get the results that not everyone's getting, you have to be willing to do what not everyone else is doing. Yeah. And she bought into that. You know, when Polestar asked her why she chose me as her manager, she said, because I said I wanted a gold record, and Rick said, great, let's go meet 500,000 people. Well, that opportunity is as much available to an independent artist as it is to Taylor Swift. There's yeah. 7 billion people in the United States of America. So if you want to sell 100,000 records and you feel you're that good, get in front of 100,000 people. Yeah. So her parents ended up calling me a little later on and said, listen, you know, Taylor would love for you to be her manager. I said, I have zero experience. She says, I know, but you've made great relationships and you don't mind asking people for help, mm -hmm. which a lot of people see that as a weakness. I, that's only been a benefit to me. You know, I'm one of the few that can say that I have broken artist in this digital era yeah. and continue to use those same tools and resources with independent artists yeah. today. So what are some uh, simple steps that independent, independent artists could take like after watching this interview to start uh, building that career in music? First things first, you got to remember the two most important things outside of your music are your website and your email list. Things that you own. Too many artists are relying solely on their Facebook or their yeah. Twitter or their Reverb Nation page, which they don't own in order to communicate with their fans. You cannot build a relationship in 140 characters. I don't care who you are. So utilize your social media as a way to get people to your website. Create some form of ethical bribe in order to get their email address. The problem yeah. is asking for telling people to subscribe to your newsletter. They're burnt out on that because all they would ever do is get pitched opportunities from bands that most of the time weren't even relevant to them because mm -hmm. these bands aren't touring nationwide. So learn how to build relationships with your fan base. Utilize your email list and use that as your way of communicating sales messages, but finding out things about them. That's one of the big things that we teach. Uh, if you go to my website, musicindustryblueprint.com, I have a free video series that just grab it, and I'll show you how to set up your websites properly, how to use social media properly, some keys to increasing your odds in the business, uh, a whole bunch of cool stuff that will – give you access to. Um, I have blogs all over my website that not only I write, which I do a program like you, it's called 25 Minutes from Nashville, mm -hmm. where I just cruise into work, drop up my iPhone on my dash and start talking smack. Yeah. <laughs> and usually what I do is I, I'm a solutions guy. So I'll identify a problem, I'll come up with a solution, 
If it's a life experience that I'm going through, I'll figure out a way to incorporate it into yeah. the music <laughs> business. Yeah. And there's always great takeaways. Yeah. I have learned that if you're going to give me the time to watch something that I create, I better bring value yeah. to you. And that's why my email open rates are so high and, yeah. and my videos get watched is because I'm not just there talking about me. I'm giving you practical, solvable solutions to some of your everyday problems. And I'm taking a lot of what's going on in the major label capacity mm -hmm. and bringing that to the independent artist world because yeah. let's face it, you know, there's just not enough space for every talented person that's out there, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't keep going after it and yeah. have the same tools and that's be taught the same things. Yeah. That we're sharing with these artists at major labels. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, you know, I keep meeting uh, lots of different independent artists that, you know, they make their living and they don't have labels, but they've taken the time to do exactly what you're talking about, you know, to focus absolutely. on their website. Uh, the ones that are more successful uh, tend to have the email list focus, you know. Well, they do, and they create, they know how to create bundles, and they know how, they know exactly yeah. what it is that their audience wants. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of them. I have a lot of them inside the Music Industry Blueprints members program. Okay. And a lot of the things that we're coming up with and getting creative inside of there. What I learned early on, Kyle, was that not everyone needed a manager or could afford a manager. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to get their questions answered. And that's why I started my business. I didn't want to try to go out and find the quote unquote next Taylor Swift. Yeah, the next if I yeah. wanted to be with the biggest star in the world, I would have stayed with Taylor. But I wasn't built for the road. My family wasn't built to be without their dad 185, 200 yeah. days a year. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's just not who I am or what I was about. So what I said was, I said, wow, I said, I've got access to great information. I have 25 years of knowledge and experience. I've been blessed with the ability to know how to communicate with people. Mm -hmm. I went and spent a fortune on myself learning how to become a better storyteller because people learn through stories. And if you could take a story and help them visually see it applied to their business, yeah. it changes everything. At that point, I mean, I have over 200 paid members in 15 different countries and nine genres of music. I'm just not that country guy anymore that every yeah. dad who has a daughter that wears sundresses and boots should come hunt down in Nashville, Tennessee. Now I've got concert pianists and people from Russia and Mexico. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know uh, uh, one of these Stan countries even existed and they showed up one day. Right you know, ready to come on board. And that's what I learned is that artist to fan engagement mm -hmm. is a universal language, no matter what genre of music yeah. you're in. And a lot of it is just psychology and human behavior. It's learning how to treat people the way that you would want to be treated. It's creating opportunities for them, those oh wow moments. And it's realizing, I'll give you a real quick example. I just did a live event here in Nashville. And so we got 150 people there and I said, all right, I said, given the opportunity, how many of you love listening to radio commercials? And I raised my hand and no one else raised their hand. I said, okay, given the opportunity to fast forward through television commercials, how many of you would do that? And all 150 raised their hand. I said, so basically it's safe for me to say that 100% of this room is not into advertisements or commercials. And they all laughed. They said, no, we hate them. I said, then why is the majority of what you send to your fans through Facebook, Twitter, and your email an advertisement or a commercial of some sort for your brand? And they all just kind of paused. I said, what we have to learn is how to start paying attention to what it is that they're interested in, delivering that to them. So when that time comes that you need to sell or you need to promote they feel obligated because we haven't beat the crap out of them with stuff all the time. Yeah. Vote for me, do for me, buy for me, do me, this, me, do this. me, me, yeah. subscribe for my newsletter, and then all of a sudden they don't hear from you for six months because you didn't have anything going on. Yeah. You know, it's just treat them like your friends. Don't expect them to do things that you wouldn't do. Yeah, is a bit of advice that I would give to people right now. It's kind of that common sense that falls flat. Yeah, common sense isn't always common practice, said Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, absolutely. And a great uh, reference there for social intelligence. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what would you say to a, an independent artist that uh, hates marketing and, and hates selling? 
enjoy some quality time alone. Uh, you have, uh, you don't have to enjoy it, but you better put a team together of people that does. Everything's marketing, whether you're trying to get laid or you're trying to get a gig, <laughs> or you're trying to sell music. You're always constantly having to market and sell. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, is that no one minds being marketed to. They mind being pressured. No one minds. Everyone wants to buy. They just hate feeling like they were sold. You know, no, so this point. is the world that we're in right now. It's it's all about your approach, you know, and, and I make fun of the fact that, you know what, guys, it's killing me to have to do this, but I got to get gas in the van. You know, it's like when you're on stage sitting there going, look, I just wish all of you every night would hear every song I played, rush on over to the merch table, buy $50, $60 worth of stuff, and then we load up and we get out of here and everything's fine. But unfortunately... That doesn't happen quite often. So let me tell you what we have back at the merch area. And by the way, we're going to be back there at the end of the show and would love to meet you. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're not marketing. You're giving them an opportunity to come see you, but you're telling them you have stuff for sale. Hmm. So there's ways that you can do things. There are certain things that you can say, hey, I know a lot of you, you know, have a babysitter and got to get home. We went ahead and autographed a bunch of CDs back at the merch table, and I'd love for you to pick one up hmm. on your way out. That's not a hard sell. That's not, oh, I can't do that. I'm too cool or it's not artsy. Bullshit. You recorded that music because you want somebody to go home with it so it can change their lives. So some people just need to get over themselves or find the person in the band who is a good pitch person or write the best songs freaking ever that people, you can't keep your CDs in stock. And usually that's not the case. Yeah. But – but that comes you know, back to seeing yourself realistically. Well, it's a privilege to be in this business. It's not a priority. It's a privilege to be on stage. It's not a priority that everyone buy your music. It's a privilege to be at a record company. It's not a priority. You know, so that's what I try to teach people is that there's no shortage of pretty people who can sing. Matter of fact, there's no shortage of ugly people who can sing real well either. Mm -hmm. You know, so what's going to make you different? What's going to allow this to be sustainable? What's going to make a club offer you the gig over the next guy that comes in to get the gig. Just because you think you're cool doesn't mean everybody else thinks you're cool. Yeah. And just because you're qualified, as you say, to be in that club, they're choosing based on different things. Which band do they feel is going to market the best to get the most drinkers in? Which band do they feel will utilize all their resources to get people in to consume their products? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a long way of saying it. Either get with it or get somebody involved that's really good at it to make that happen for you. Yeah, that's a great way. <laughs> that's a great way of putting it. And it comes down to uh, putting the other person's interests in mind that you're that you're dealing with. You know, so absolutely. You, yeah, you're as an artist. Yes, like we all like. I can say this as a musician t too. I would love to just make music and and not have to worry about anything else. But there comes a point where it if you want to move forward, you have to look at what the reality is and you have to be able Absolutely. to accept it for what it is and then say, what's the next step I take from here? Well, Kyle, the problem that I run into, and I say this to everyone who comes to town and everyone who wants to get in the music business is you're trying to function in a dysfunctional business. Your rewards are not in direct proportion to the work that you put in. Yeah. And that sucks. Mostly you work an hour, you get paid an hour. You build a car, you sell the car for this much. You do a job, you get paid for this job. You can be doing it all right. You can be writing every day. You can be doing your social media every day. You can be marketing your ass off and no one, you know, you just can't control it. That's why this business isn't for everyone. Mm -hmm. But also too, is if you think about it, there's a lot of great artists. There's very few superstars and there's very few iconic artist the the level of work ethic and mentality that goes from being just somebody who's good to somebody who's great is huge most people aren't willing to do it mm -hmm. so that's why there's a lot of people that we've heard on the radio that we've never heard again yeah then there's these iconic artists now what's funny is these iconic artists may not be the artist that necessarily had the most radio hits ask the grateful dead yeah ask bruce springsteen yeah. You know, those they had people who were just so into what it is that they did. They just delivered quality product for 
their group. They fed the hungry people. Mm -hmm. They encouraged people to spread the message. They were remarkable. People remarked about what happened with the Grateful Dead. I sit there and tell people the best model of free music for information is the Grateful Dead. Hell, they encourage people. You record it, you share it with your friends, and then we're going to charge you 30 bucks to get high and dance around with a whole bunch of people and sing the songs that you all know the words to because we gave you the music. You know, that's the best form of marketing, in my opinion, ever in the music business is to sit there and say, here's places where you can record our music and go share it with your friends. Mm -hmm. How brilliant is that? That's completely brilliant. Is there a bigger markup on a 79 cent download or a $20 t-shirt? They're not going to buy the t-shirt unless they feel a connection with you. Use the music to make the connection. But everybody holds on to the music or they'll only put a minute and a half of it up on their website. Oh, yeah. It's stolen. I'm like, dude, you can only hope that someone steals your shit. You know, you can only hope that your stuff's so good that people want to take it and share it. So uh, you're probably, you, I'm, I'm guessing that you probably would tell an independent artist to, to stop complaining about music piracy as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we had a chance years ago, Napster. Everybody's there. Only place. Instead, the record companies and the lawyers and everybody came in and boom, they scattered like roaches. Had they not gone to 30 million people and said, you know what? How are you liking this file sharing thing? You know, Kyle's got that great record. He shares it with Rick. It's all cool. By the way, listen, keep doing what you're doing, but we're going to go ahead and just add a dollar. We're just going to charge you a buck every month, but have as much music as you possibly want. Do you not think that the $30 million a month would have been enough to figure out a way to make sure the majority of the folks getting pirated were getting paid? Yeah. Yeah, Instead, they splattered them out and ran them all over the place. Big, huge mistake. Same thing right now. It's like... You know, yes, it's your art, but isn't the whole idea for people to get it and to change people's lives? And you know what? Yeah. Not everyone's going to hijack it. And if that person gave, if I give you something and then I call and they go, hey, dude, that song I gave you, guess what? They're coming to play next week yeah. and I got us tickets. Yeah. You just made more money from them off the tickets than you did off yeah. the song. But had they not heard the song, they never would have been there. Yeah. And it's like a lot of artists have a hard time seeing things long term like that, like being able to understand how you go from this point where someone's sharing a bunch of music till maybe a couple months down that down the road, that one person who stole my song will come to a show and buy a t-shirt. So it's like for you had didn't have to do anything. Your, your song was besides just create the music and, and you obviously have the marketing. Hey, write it off as marketing or take your taxes, write it off as marketing. Say, okay. I figure I had a hundred downloads or a hundred songs stolen this year at four cents or whatever your little pennies are. Write it off as a marketing budget. Absolutely. If you're set up like a business, like you should be write it off as marketing. Excellent. So like I said, I only hope that people want to take my videos and steal them or plagiarize them or use them. Absolutely. There's so many people in my line of work that that don't have the relationships that I have that can go take this video, send it to somebody in Bangladesh, get it transcribed, create it, make it their own and say exactly what I said. Yeah. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. Yeah. And you know what? All I want is a bunch of people saying what I'm saying because it's like I started teaching at SAE Institute and everybody goes, dude, why are you teaching? I said, well, one, it's funny because I only have a GED so that they've asked me to even be an instructor. I said, but secondly, as I said, I've helped them create a curriculum where you can get an associate's degree in music business in 16 months. And we cut the fluff out. Everything that we do is pertaining to what you're doing in the business. It's a great program for someone who wants to be an artist or a manager or a booking agent or anything like that. Then what I also do is I allow the students, as soon as they start school, they go into the music industry blueprint and they start interviewing artists. And they're going to get assigned an artist that they're responsible for from day one yeah. till they graduate. A part of their grade is going to be dependent upon the growth of that artist because that's life. If you want to learn how to be a manager, manage. You want to learn how to be a publicist, write press releases, tour press. You want to learn how to be a booking agent, book shows for your local band. You know, there's a lot of things that people have to learn. And that's the cool part about this position I'm in right now is I get to teach them and help develop this next generation of little badass managers that only know one way. It's like results. Yeah. You get paid based on your results. So go get results. 
bam, I'm blown. I'm like, floored <laughs> by that. <laughs> I'm just like floored by that. No, it's great. I mean, thinking in terms of results instead of, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I admit, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of traditional schooling because I feel like it doesn't always operate in reality. Sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like the kind of learning that you, that you've done. It's very well. It's like trade school learning. You know, in New Zealand, when they go to college, they go to a trade school. You know, it's like I I'm adding psychology and human behavior in there because you need that with everything you do. Yeah, we're teaching artists how to record their own two track and four track recordings and how to edit yeah. an iMovie and do all the things that they need to do to create content to sell to their fans. We're teaching them in math royalty accounting, mm-hmm. understanding your iTunes residuals when they come in and what it means and what your manager so we're just making everything practical and that's what I'm about everything I'm about is practical I love a lot of music you know I everybody goes who's your favorite Uh, Prince is my all-time favorite of all times you know it's like this guy did everything but that guy's a businessman too and right now Prince who has been monstrous who just put a new band together he's over in Europe touring right now and you know what he's getting per ticket $10. $10. You know what he said? He says, I can't go out and charge people for what I did before. I'm with a new band and we're doing new material. Mm-hmm. And that's what new bands have to start off on at $10. That is a freaking brilliant wow. man. That he says, I'm not going to be playing Purple Rain in 1999 and all these things. This is me and my new band. And with new bands, I can't charge you for what I've done in the past. So this is what I'm doing. Wow. That's impressive because that, that, shows a lot of control over ego too. Yeah, you should Google search that article. I think it would be a good one for you to talk about uh, with what you do with your blog. That might be a great article to reblog about. Uh, and, uh, but you, look it up. I read it somewhere that he was in Europe charging ten dollars a ticket. Okay, gotcha. Now I, I just want to close up here with um, uh, how independent artists, you know, anyone listening to this show, if they want to connect more with you, uh, maybe uh, get some free tips from you, some insights. Yeah, I know that you have just think you go to my website musicindustryblueprint.com and read the blogs uh, subscribe get yourself the free video series and that's the best way to get a hold of me there's nothing on there that you can buy uh, if you decide down the road you want to become a member into the blueprint we have to have a conversation I don't let everyone in mm-hmm. uh, because not everyone's willing to do the work yeah. and there's work involved yeah. but you know I've got a bunch of cool programs depending on where people are at but okay. first things first, if they're not willing to go get free advice from a guy who helped launch one of the biggest stars in the world, they're not the type of person I want to work with anyway. Yeah. And they're probably not as serious about this business as they think because they want someone else to do it for them. Yeah. You are your own business. It's you, Inc. It's not Rick, Inc. or Kyle, Inc. or Major Label, Inc. It's you, Inc. Yeah. So first things first, get as much education as you can. No one can ever take away experience and knowledge from you. So get as much experience and knowledge as you possibly can, but make sure you're getting it from the right people. Yeah, excellent, man. And uh, yeah, I'm loving this interview, by the way, because like uh, <laughs> the way the way you're talking about these issues, I think um, the way you say it, and not only what you say, but the way you say it is something that artists need to hear. Because I think uh, artists, you know, we see ourselves sometimes. Some of us see ourselves as you know the we're sensitive to like. Uh, the artistry of it and we're very sensitive sure. about the business and but sometimes artists need a kick in the ass you know well you get way. sensitive to being broke get sensitive to not playing in front of packed houses hmm. and then do everything you can to get over that you know and that's the thing is you know somebody said something and I'm gonna it's gonna be paraphrased wrong but they said if you if what you're working towards you're not getting, you haven't set your goal high enough yet. You know, I mean, it's like you have to be willing to die for something. You got to be willing to sacrifice for something. And if you haven't gotten there, you haven't, that sacrifice isn't, there isn't enough sacrifice yet. You haven't found a goal worth dying over yet. You haven't, you're still kind of in that comfort zone. You're still kind of. You have the plan B. You have the back. Yeah, it's like, go for it. You know, I, dude, I was, my very first, pitch that I did at a college was called, so you want to be in the music business. How can a guy who was on the free lunch program with the GED continue to make six figures a year in the music business? Yeah, they all showed up. They wanted to hear that story. And then when they find out that, you know, I was Taylor Swift's former manager and I'm a recovering drug addict of 22 years, now they're like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, because I always tell the kids at college, I go, look, I envy you. You know, when, when I was your age, I was high. 
You know, there wasn't an option for me to be in college because they didn't let crackheads in college. That's just not what they did. You know, they that wasn't a goal of a junkie is to go in and say, hey, you know, I'm going to go to school today. But, you know, after I got sober and after I realized that I had let a lot of precious time slip away, I started finding knowledge as fast as I could. I started finding anyone who would have a conversation with me because I squandered away five years of my life being a knucklehead. Yeah. So I had to fast track this program. I had to get myself in a position to say, okay, it's not like when Taylor asked me to manage her and I should have, could have said, oh, sorry, I need to take four years off and go to Berkeley or Full Sail or Belmont. Yeah. I'm like, no, she needed a job done. I went out and found the answers. Yeah. Everyone can go do exactly what it is that I did. You can't take Taylor from zero to four million. That's already been done. But you, you've got the time. The resources are out there. Yeah. Or you bring somebody on like me and say, okay, I want to fast track this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take 25 years to learn Rick's 25 years of experience, but boy, I'll pay to have some time with him. I'll understand this. I'll get his program because he's eliminating a lot of the problems that I'm having right now. Mm -hmm. And that's all I want to do is be a solution yeah. for people. That's all I want to do is provide answers to their questions, but then show them, how to go do it. There's a lot of people telling you what to do in this business. There's not a lot of people that can show you because they don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But they're great talkers yeah. and they're great teachers. Mm -hmm. Find somebody who can roll their sleeves up and show you exactly what it is that you need to do. Uh, and, you know, then you're in business <laughs> at that point. The music biz. <laughs> the music business. <laughs> well, Rick, man, awesome. Thanks again uh, for sharing You're all this anytime. awesome knowledge. Um, what, make sure to have like all of your links set up below. So, guys, just remember to scroll down past the video and uh, click through his links. Check out his blog. Read that. Also, sign up to his newsletter. Get your three free videos as well. Again, Rick, thank you so much. Got one last question for you. Sure. Uh, I... I am pretty sure that your favorite album is probably a Prince album, but I want you to tell me what your life would be like if it never existed. If that album never existed? You know what's funny? That's probably not – I don't know that I have because I'm, I'm a big fan of his album called The B-Sides. Uh, you know what? I, I don't know that I can answer that because I'm not – I can tell you what life would be like if I didn't have God. I can't tell you what life would be like if I didn't have a particular album. Okay. Uh, and I'm not saying that to kind of get all religious and stuff like that. I'm just trying to think. It's like, I mean, there are certain songs that affect me and touch me in, in different ways, okay. you know. Uh, but, you know, if somebody said today you couldn't, yeah, you know, it's, it's like it's funny. And, and, and I hate to even admit this right now. I don't listen to as much music as I used to because I'm so busy listening to I Love Marketing podcast and yeah. the marketing hot seat yeah. to help make the dreams of my students yeah. come true. You know, it's like I feel I'm doing a disservice if I'm off gelling to Journey's greatest hits or something. There's a great album, by the way, you know, or Earth, Wind and Fire or, you know, whatever, yeah. you know. Eric Church's record or Brantley Gilbert, you know, I have yeah. a lot of music that I like, but I don't spend as much time listening to music anymore because my passion is now seeing people achieve their dreams. I always yeah. tell folks, you know what, guys, yeah. I've flown on the private jets. I've been on the red carpets. I've had artists say thank you to me from, you know, the stage at major award shows. Now my goal is to try to help you figure out how that can happen for okay. you. So it's a good question, but I'm probably the wrong guy to <laughs> ask it too unfortunately yeah it usually it usually it, it's rare that that question ever gets answered straightforward like someone's like oh that yeah, might change my questions up then a little bit uh, <laughs> <laughs> or oh, come up it. with a different question you know oh, i love it because it stumps them at the end but most people they no, usually that's come good through. but you know what it made me think about a lot of things so it's a great question if it makes you think yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. what All you right. do is you keep a running total of people Guests who have answered, guests who have not, and run the score well, they, up. No, they, yeah, they answered, but it's usually they answer with two albums, or they have to think about it for what seems like forever, but it's usually five sure. seconds or something. Sure, the power of the edit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Or the middle. Do, 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 yeah, that's what I was thinking. I usually think about the um, Jeopardy theme. or the. Yeah, that's right. That's it. <laughs> All right, Rick. Well, thank you very much, man. You're um, welcome very much. Okay. Check you later. 
You too. And that wraps up this week's episode of Seeds of Music on the show. Today we had Rick Barker from musicindustryblueprint.com sharing his vast wealth and wisdom from inside the major music record industry. Now, uh, make sure to check out his links below. Head over to musicindustryblueprint.com and put in your email address to get your five secrets to making it in the music industry. Next, if you haven't yet, sign up for our Seeds of Music email newsletter. You'll get updates on new interviews, vlog episodes, and articles, plus special newsletter only content to help you build a bigger fan base and sell more music online and once again we also have the itunes podcast so make sure to subscribe to that to get the episodes and please please leave a rating and review that would help out so 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 much and if you enjoyed this interview like and share it on facebook and also tweet it out on twitter or share it on any social media that you use uh, maybe you got reddit or dig it would be awesome if you could share that link that would also really really help the show grow and grow and grow as well and lastly comment on the video i'd love to hear what your thoughts thoughts were on this interview and also thoughts on any future interviews like if you know someone who you would like to see on the show who is a full-time independent artist or music industry professional who's got some awesome knowledge to share or maybe that person is you i have an open door email policy just email me at kyle.seedsandmusic at gmail.com that goes straight to me at the most it'll take me two days to get back to you but i do get back to every single email that comes through my inbox and remember we are the future of music